Andrei Chikatilo is known as one of the most gruesome serial killers in Russia. His victims were found brutally murdered and mutilated beyond recognition. Their abdomens were sliced open, internal organs spilling out. Andre even admitted to putting one of his victims' uterus in his mouth and chewing on it. Andre had a wife and kids of his own, but that didn't stop him from killing 53 plus young women and children. Overall, Andre Chikatilo was tried for 53 murders and confessed to 56. His sexual sadism was a huge motivator for his killings. He would often attempt to rape his victims, but could never fully achieve an erection. This would send him into a rage so intense he would slice his victims to death with the knife he always carried. If his victims tried to scream for help, he would shove dirt or mud down their throats. Andre's other common titles are the Butcher of Rostov, the Red Ripper, and the Rostov Ripper. There was a village that lied on fertile land and was often referred to as a farmer's dream. However, in the mid-1930s, a famine would lead to millions of people starving or dead. Andrei Chikatilo was born into this miserable time in that very village on October 16, 1936, in Yabloknoi, Ukraine. During the 1930s, six to eight million people, mostly lower class, died of starvation during the famine known as Holodomor. Four to five million of those people were Ukrainians. Andre's mother and father were both collective farmhands who didn't receive any wage for their labor. Instead, the family was able to cultivate a plot of land behind their one-room hut. Despite this plot of land, the family would often not have an adequate amount of food. Andre claimed that his family would frequently eat grass and leaves to diminish their hunger. He also stated that he hadn't eaten bread until he was 12 years old. What's most disturbing about the famine that Andre Chikatilo grew up in was that some people had to resort to cannibalism to survive. Axis armies occupied Ukraine from 1941 to 1944. Andre's father, Roman, was enrolled into the Red Army in World War II against Germany. He was subsequently captured by Nazis and placed in a concentration camp. Roman was freed by Americans in 1945 and returned to his family. Andre's father and entire family were apparently scorned after his return because it was seen as weak and humiliating to be taken prisoner. The state saw any person who made contact with the outside world, even a prisoner of war, a suspect, an enemy to the people. This event would also lead to Andre being severely bullied in school. He was forced to witness the terrifying effects of war up close, stating that he witnessed bombings, shootings, and fires. Andre claimed he and his mother had to hide in ditches and cellars, and even witnessed their hut burn to the ground. Andre also recalled seeing corpses, blood, and parts of human bodies during his childhood. Andre's mother gave birth to Tatyana, a baby girl, in 1943, during which Andre's father was still being held captive in the war. Due to the fact that many soldiers who occupied Ukraine raped the native women, it's speculated that a German soldier was the father of baby Tatyana and the pregnancy had been forced upon her. It's also assumed that because Andre and his mother lived in a one-room hut, the rape could have possibly occurred in his presence. These are the condition and times that Andre Chikatilo was raised in. Famine, death, hardship, and world war. In addition to growing up in this external chaotic environment, Andre also suffered internal hardships. He was believed to have suffered from hydrocephalus, a buildup of cerebrospinal fluid in the hollow places inside the brain. This condition causes poor appetite, vomiting, and slowed development. Later in life, this would heavily affect Andre. This caused him to have urinary tract problems, which led him to wet the bed into his late teens, and it also gave him the inability to sustain an erection. Andre's mother would beat and ridicule him every time he would wet the bed, mortifying him on a regular basis. 
When people recalled going to primary school with Andre Chikatilo, they described an introverted outcast that never got along with anyone or made an effort to. To the other students, he was always in a dream state. Andre also suffered from severe short-sightedness, which he feared for other people finding out. He didn't tell his teachers nor his family, so he wouldn't have to wear glasses. He was already seen as an outcast and didn't want to be targeted by bullies further or mocked for having the need to wear the glasses. Andre claimed, quote, at school, I was an object of ridicule and could not defend myself. If I didn't have a pen or ink, I used to sit and cry. When Andre began hitting puberty, his classmates teased him for his breasts, claiming that they were too big. They called him Baba, a derogatory Russian word for a woman. Once when Andre was at the urinal in school, a boy said that his foreskin wasn't quote, odd shape. This too was spread around the school, and Andre wasn't the type to shrug these kinds of things off. Later in his adolescence, things started lightening up for Andre. He was no longer the shy, introverted boy that people had known. He was tall and claimed to be the strongest in the entire school. He was able to claim a seat in the front row of the classroom instead of sitting in the back with no chance of seeing the board. His teachers claimed he was a good student and an avid reader of acclaimed Russian writers. Andre also had a phenomenal memory and could remember, quote, events and even long strings of meaningless numbers. He was on his way to becoming the model citizen that Stalin wanted. He succumbed to the propaganda that spewed into all the students and began reading Marx, Engels, and Lenin religiously. At the age of 16, he became the editor of his school newspaper and was given the important task of explaining recent political events. Although Andre was thriving physically and academically, he still suffered in another area that other boys his age were driving into, girls. Andre Chikatilo was apparently terrified of girls and would blush at the slightest interaction with them. It wasn't until the spring of 1954, when Andre was 17, that he would have an interaction with a young girl that was quite disturbing. He had been home alone when 13-year-old Tanya Bala came to the door looking for his younger sister, Tatiana. Apparently, the girl didn't make an attempt to leave after being told that his sister wasn't there, so Andre weirdly saw this as an attempt to seduce him. He became aroused and threw himself onto her. They remained clothed and lied pressed together on the floor for a few minutes. Another source claims that this girl was only 11 years old, and he had wrestled her to the ground, ejaculating as the girl tried to escape. Considering Andre Chikatilo's obsession with overpowering his victims, it seems like the latter is more likely to be true. After this interaction, he apparently felt ashamed and was revolted by his first sexual experience. This event was so revolting to him that he decided to remain abstinent until marriage. Despite Andre doing very well in school, he was rejected from the university he applied for. His confidence was broken and convinced himself that his rejection was due to his father's capture during the war. He began harvesting a deep hatred for his father after the rejection. However, his refusal was not due to his father's war capture at all. Andre had applied to one of the top law schools in the area, and the competition was stacked against him. It all came down to entrance exams, and other students had done better. Instead of trying at a lower level college, Andre settled on a local technical one. Andre began experimenting in his sex life at the age of 19. Tanya apparently took a liking to him, and a romance began. They tried having intercourse twice, but both attempts failed. The relationship only lasted two months, and Andre graduated college months later. He tried having sex again with local girls in a town 800 miles east of Moscow, but he kept running into problems. He could never maintain an erection, and the girls would often mock him for it. This caused Andre to spiral into an episode of depression and lose the confidence he once had. Andre was eventually drafted into the military and served three years in the communication unit. He would go out with the other soldiers to pick up women, but Andre was frightened that this would lead them to finding out about his inability to maintain an erection. He also feared this would lead to more bullying and ridicule 
that he had suffered frequently in school. He started staying back in the barracks instead of going out and would indulge in political literature instead. This, and rumors of his sexual encounters, caused other soldiers to claim that Andre was gay. This horrified him. On one occasion, Andre was cuddling with a girl, and at one point she started to push away. But Andre didn't let go. He liked the tension and struggle of the woman. He eventually let go, but not without feeling himself ejaculate in his pants beforehand. This was a terrifying link that his subconscious made to the arousal he experienced due to the woman's fear and struggle. After the end of his military career, Andre moved back to the family's village at the age of 24. He soon realized that he didn't, in fact, want to settle there, so he went east across the border into Russia. He got a job as a telephone engineer in a small town 20 miles north of the city of Rostov. Andre convinced his family to move there, so they all crammed into a one-room apartment until they had enough money saved up to move out into their own home. Andre remained shy at this time and fearful of the thought of even talking to a woman. This led him to frequently masturbate at all the wrong times and in all the wrong places. Once, he was enjoying lunch with a few co-workers in the woods when he disappeared on the pretense of having to use the restroom. But his short-sightedness and refusal to obtain glasses finally caught up with him. He couldn't see his co-workers, but they could see and hear him loud and clear. When he returned, one man shouted, quote, Andre goes into the woods to masturbate. Andre was obviously incredibly embarrassed and would further isolate himself from co-workers. Tatyana began worrying about Andre when he turned 27. Most Russians had been married with kids by then. That all changed when she came across Finya at a salon in 1963. She thought the two would be a perfect match. Finya was three years younger than Andre and was incredibly confident, a trait that Andre severely lacked. After spending much time together, the couple eventually hit it off. Finya was shocked by Andre's kind and gentle nature towards women. This nature, however, was only due to his extreme shyness. Finya and Andre married in 1963 and attempted sex for the first time. Finya soon realized the reason Andre wasn't trying to have sex with her all along. He couldn't maintain an erection and was incredibly embarrassed by it. Intercourse between the two subsequently turned into an obligation to have children. In 1965, Finya gave birth to their first daughter, Ludmila. In 1969, their second child was born, a boy named Yuri. In 1971, Andre received a degree from Rostov University in Russian philology and literature. With his new degree, he went in search of a better job and landed one as a Russian teacher in Novoshoktinsk. Andre was excited about his new teaching career, but that soon changed when he stood up on the first day of class and was ruthlessly mocked by his own students. He couldn't discipline them in the slightest, so they yelled, ran about, and even smoked right in front of him. His colleagues had a disdain for him as well, especially because he never wanted to get drinks with them or even touch a bottle of vodka. Andre's miserable sex life soon began to pour into his everyday life as a teacher. He started crossing lines with his students, with wandering eyes and wandering hands. Some students were boarding at the school, and he took advantage of that as well. Andre would suddenly walk into their dorms without warning when the girls would be getting ready for bed. Girls would later describe him staring at them and obviously masturbating through a pocket in his pants. These issues got progressively worse, and Andre got more and more comfortable with the disturbing behavior. In May of 1973, whilst swimming with some students in a river, he isolated Liuba, a 15-year-old girl, and sexually assaulted her. He grabbed her hips and began fondling her breasts and genitals. Liuba began to scream, but this only increased his desire to touch her. He assaulted her further, wanting her to scream. It brought him the sexual gratification he desired. He only stopped when other students swam over to see what was going on. Later that same month, he got 14-year-old Anya to stay after class alone with him. He beat her with a ruler. She attempted to get away, but this only increased his arousal. He ejaculated in the process of wrestling her into a chair. 
He then stormed out of the classroom and locked the door behind him. Anya escaped through a window and ran home to tell her parents of the horrific experience. Andre escaped punishment on both of these sexual assaults, and his molestations worsened further. He went on to molest his wife's six-year-old niece on multiple occasions. What's even more disturbing is that Finya knew of his predatory actions and simply brushed it off, stating, quote, What do you know? He obviously wanted to try out someone younger. Action was finally brought down against Andre Chikatilo in January of 1974, but justice wasn't served. He was forced to resign from his teaching position and went off to another school to continue his reign of terror on different students. However, his fear of being caught limited him, and the youngest students there were 15. He preferred the really young ones. Luckily, due to the budget cuts, he was let go in September of 1978. Andre and his wife were both soon hired at a different technical school, and they were both given a room inside the school itself to stay. It wasn't long before Andre continued assaulting his students. This time, it was young boys. In the fall of 1978, Andre entered a dorm and approached a 15-year-old boy. He pulled back the sheets and began performing oral sex. When the young boy awoke, Andre ran away. A few days later, Andre returned again, but this time, the boys were all waiting for him, and they all ran him out of the room. This story became the talk of the school, but Andre again escaped punishment for his assault on a child. Andre soon became terrified of being caught again, so he bought a rundown house of his own to indulge in his disturbing fantasies. He would bring back sex workers and drug users to his hut, but his favorite was little girls. At one point, he was able to bring back two six-year-old girls to his home and assaulted them both. This would lead Andre to jump at any opportunity to bring back a little girl to his hut. The first unfortunate victim of Andre Chikatilo was nine-year-old Yelena Zakitnova. Andre described this killing to prosecutors, but later withdrew his confession in court. On December 22, 1978, Andre had gotten off work at 5 p.m. and headed to a Russian supermarket. As he walked back, he saw Yelena on the street, alone. Yelena was wearing a red coat with a black furry collar, a rabbit hat, and felt boots. Andre immediately approached her and struck up a conversation with the little girl. He asked where she had been and she replied, quote, I've been visiting with a friend. They continued the conversation as Yelena urgently walked home. Her mother was going to be worried, she told him. Suddenly, Yelena realized that she had to go to the restroom, but she didn't want to go outside because it was freezing out. Andre was being nice to the young girl, and he reminded her of her grandfather. She trusted him. Andre told the little girl that he lived just around the corner, and she could use the restroom there. They walked a while and finally arrived at his front door. Yelena was relieved that she would finally be able to use the restroom, but she never got the chance. Andre shut the door behind them and jumped on top of her, pressing his entire weight. Yelena began to scream and cry, but Andre covered her mouth. He wanted to rape the little girl, but was unable to get an erection. This enraged Andre. In this process of trial and error at raping Yelena, he ruptured her hymen. The sight of her blood derived the deepest sexual gratification that Andre had ever experienced. Up until this point, Andre had only been hurting and dominating his victims. However, this event made him realize that he needed more than that. He needed blood. He took a knife from his pocket and dove into a frenzy. He stabbed Yelena in the stomach three times and started ripping her body apart with his bare hands. He wanted to touch every inch of the girl, inside and out. He then put his hands around the little girl's throat and squeezed what little life she had left out of her. Andre began to panic. He had never killed anyone before. He made sure no one was around, then took Yelena's body to a nearby river and chucked her body and school bag into the stream. This was the first of 56 murders Andre Chikatilo would go on to commit each one growing more sinister and disturbing than the last. <laughs>
Yelena Zukotnova's body was found a couple days later, on December 24, 1978, in the very river that Andre had tossed her in. Her book bag was lying nearby. There wasn't a lot for police to go on other than the location of the girl's body. They asked around the nearby village in which Andre lived. After interviewing a neighbor of his, she told them to look into Andre. She said he had women and young girls going in and out of his hut most nights. She also told authorities that his house's lights had been left on all night, which she found very unusual. Police interviewed Andre Chikatilo eight or nine times. However, his alibi released him from their suspicions. His wife claimed he was home that evening, and police didn't look into him further. It's strange that they took him off their list of suspects, considering they knew his history of sexually assaulting children at his prior schools. But for whatever reason, Andre was able to slip away and continue on his killing spree. The authorities shifted their attention instead to Alexander Kravchenko, who had been convicted of a similar killing six years prior. Alexander eventually confessed to the murder he didn't commit, and police were convinced as well. When Alexander went to court, he claimed the confession was beaten into him, and that he was an innocent man. He was found guilty and received 15 years in a labor camp. Several years later, Alexander received the death penalty that the public was waiting for. He was killed by a firing squad in 1984. The small bits of evidence in that case the authorities did have was treated poorly or sadly dismissed. One officer spotted blood across from Andre's house, but his superior claimed it was probably animal blood. In March of 1981, Andre was let go from his teaching job and began working as a supply clerk. This new career would require him to take frequent business trips, sometimes for a day, sometimes over a week. It was an ideal career for someone who wanted to kill. On September 3rd, 1981, Andre Chikatilo stood outside a public library, picking up his next unsuspecting victim, 17-year-old Larissa Kachinko. Larissa had been waiting for a bus to take her back to a farm that she and her classmates had been working on. Andre approached the girl, 30 years his junior, and asked her to go for a stroll. She accepted. Andre told Larissa that he was taking her to a recreation center. The two left the main road and cut through some woods, out of sight from anyone. Andre had been fantasizing about the gruesome things he would do to young children for years, and now, he was able to make it into a horrifying reality for his victims. Andre pushed Larissa to the ground and began his animalistic attack. She began to scream, but he was able to stifle them by pushing dirt into her mouth. He began beating her and strangling her to death. Andre then bit off the young girl's nipples from her now deceased body. Unlike his first murder, Andre didn't feel the need to run away. Instead, he grabbed Larissa's clothes and circled her body like a shark. Years later, Andre said that in this moment, he felt like a partisan. The shock that Andre had experienced after his first kill didn't come. He felt numb. He justified the murder in his mind, thinking that Larissa had deserved to be a victim after agreeing to go off with a man she didn't know. Andre Chikatilo didn't kill again until June 12, 1982, nine months later. That morning, 13-year-old Luba Beryuk was asked by her mother to go to a nearby village and grab some food. It was a warm day, and all she was wearing was a thin, blue and white floral dress with a pair of sandals. A little boy had seen Luba waiting for the bus, but for some reason the bus didn't come, so she decided to walk home instead. It was on this walk that she met Andre Chikatilo, Andre caught up with Luba and asked her typical questions. What's your name? What are you up to? Where are you going? When the two departed from public sight into an area behind some bushes, Andre attacked the little girl. He ripped off her clothes and began stabbing and slicing at different points of her body. The medical examiner concluded that she had suffered 22 knife wounds to her head, neck, chest, and pelvic region. Luba's body was discovered two weeks later. Her remains had decayed down to the bones. Andre Chikatilo would go on to commit six more murders in the year 1982. During two separate business trips, 
He brutally murdered 14-year-old Luba Voleboyeva on July 25th, and 9-year-old Oleg Pozadayev, his first male victim, on August 13th. Luba's body was found on August 7th, but Oleg's body was never recovered. 16-year-old Olya Kuprina was killed on August 16th, just three days later. Andre killed 19-year-old Ira Karabelnikova in September, nine days before killing 15-year-old Sergei Kuzmin, a boarding school runaway. Andre eventually confessed to authorities of the December 11th murder of Olga Stalmaknok. The 10-year-old girl was apparently lured from a bus stop on her way home from piano lessons. However, Andre later recanted this confession during his trial. At the end of 1982, Rostov police finally started connecting the dots that they had a serial killer on their hands. They formed a special unit to investigate the brutal murders called Leso Palusa, or Forest Path, which came about because it was where most of Andre's victims' bodies were found. Due to the nature of these murders and the fact that they were stacking up quickly, police suppressed media coverage of any of it. Authorities didn't want to cause panic to the public about this unknown serial killer on the loose. But what's terrifying about Andre Chikatilo wasn't just the fact that he was killing, it was how he was killing. To the police, their unknown suspect was more monster than man. He was purposely torturing his victims and drawing out their slow, brutal deaths, and he loved it. Almost all of the bodies that they found were mutilated to the point where it looked like a wild animal had ripped them to shreds. Abdomens were cut open with a full view of their internal organs, and many victims had their inner and outer sexual organs carved off. Autopsies of Andre Chikatilo's victims revealed that these dissections occurred while some of the victims were alive and possibly conscious of what was happening to their bodies. Most serial killers have signatures. These signatures are acts that the murderer repeats in all or most of their killings, and they help police establish a pattern and connect the victim to their killer. Andre Chikatilo had an unusually diverse range of victims, but what stood out to police were their eyes. Andre would stab into and around the eye sockets of his victims. One theory suggests that Andre did this because he was ashamed of his killings and went as far as gouging out their eyes so he didn't have to look into them. When the killings continued, they pulled two more people from the same hostel that housed mentally handicapped men and got them to confess. But of course, Andre Chikatilo's murdering spree continued. Andre Chikatilo's path of murderous destruction eventually leached into the livelihood of the living as well. Police were baffled about who could possibly commit such heinous murders, especially to children. When they were building a profile of who the killer could be, they chose a path of ignorance and concluded that the murderer must be mentally handicapped. An officer arrested two mentally handicapped men for auto theft. However, the officer suspected something more sinister of the two. In September of 1983, the men confessed to raping and killing several women and children. Apparently, they had provided enough detail about the murders that police had no doubt that they committed the crimes, because according to them, a mentally handicapped individual wouldn't be able to do that unless they were guilty. The charges against them were eventually dropped on October 8, 1984. On March 27, 1984, the body of 10-year-old Dima Chasnikov was discovered. He had suffered 54 stab wounds. Near his body, police found a partial footprint in the mud and collected saliva and semen samples from the boy's clothes. A neighbor had witnessed the killer walking with Dima, but she only saw the back of him. She described a man in his 50s, around 6 feet tall. Dima was Andre Chikatilo's 20th victim. Andre's next victim was a woman he had known for years. In the past, the two had both committed acts of adultery for one another, but eventually it came to an end. Andre stumbled upon Tatyana at the train station and knew he could convince her to join him in the woods if he promised drinks and a picnic. He also remembered that she had a daughter who would be 11 now and asked her to bring the girl along. He even promised her a doll to play with. Andre knew the risks of potentially murdering someone he knew, but he couldn't resist his temptations. 
After all, it had been more than a month since his last murder. The three traveled by train to a secluded part of some woods. Tatiana suspected nothing sinister. It was a sunny spring day, and she thought she could trust her old friend Andre. Tatiana had already begun drinking and was noticeably impaired. Andre, on the other hand, was sober. He couldn't risk making any slip-ups. Andre, Tatiana, and her daughter Sveta got off at a nearly deserted train station and walked ten minutes into a stretch of woods. The next train wouldn't pass through for another hour. Andre got Tatiana to lie down as Sveta wandered off a few hundred yards playing with her new doll. Andre tried having sex with Tatiana, but like the many times before, he couldn't achieve an erection. Tatiana was probably very intoxicated at this point, and even commented, quote, call yourself a real man? That's when Andre Chikatilo snapped. He grabbed a long kitchen knife from his bag and stabbed Tatiana in the skull. She let out a blood-curdling scream as Andre finished her off by beating her with a hammer. Sveta heard her mother's desperate screams for help and ran back to where she had left him, but the man she got off the train with looked different now. He didn't look like a charming older man that had given her a doll. He looked like a wild animal, crouched over her blood-soaked mother. Sveta turned and ran for her life as the half-naked man chased her through the isolated woods, but she was only eleven, and Andre was able to catch up to her. He stabbed her with the same knife he had stabbed her mother with. He then proceeded to beat Sveta to death with the hammer. Andre then severed her head completely off and dropped it five yards from her body. Authorities didn't discover Sveta's body until July 5th, and the woods were so dense there that they didn't discover her mother's body until a family having a picnic complained of a horrible smell three weeks later. If Andre Chikatilo had been committing these gruesome murders in America, it would have been the front page headlines until he was caught, and because of that, he probably would have been caught sooner. But due to the times in Russia, events like these weren't allowed to be blasted through the media, and if it did make it to a newspaper, it would have been at the bottom, with a very vague description. The people of Rostov had nearly no idea that there was a brutal serial killer on the loose, there's no way to tell what could have happened if the media was allowed to talk about the horrible things the mysterious serial killer was doing. If they released the fact that a man was murdering women and children, gouging out their eyes, and cutting out their internal organs, maybe people would have been taking more precautions. Maybe people would have put more pressure on the police to catch the killer. Maybe dozens of lives could have been saved. On December 12, 1984, Andre Chikatilo appeared in court on charges of theft from his former employer. The judge sentenced him to a year of corrective labor, but because Andre had already served three months, the judge let him go. By this point, Andre had already killed 31 people, and he was about to kill dozens more. What's even more disturbing is that Andre had been arrested a few months before this, on the 13th of September. Police had watched him go up to several young women and children at a bus station, they witnessed Andre committing fruiteristic acts and decided to search his bag. They found an 8-inch knife and a jar of Vaseline. They took him in on account of his theft charge and took his blood. Andre had also matched the description of the last person to be seen with Demi Chasnikov. They compared his blood type to the semen samples found at the scene. It wasn't a match. Andre's blood was type A and the samples were classified as AB. Andre was allowed to walk away a free man. On August 27, 1985, another one of Andre's victims was discovered. The body of 18-year-old Irina Golieva. Irina was found cut open down the middle, from her neck to her pelvis. Her eyes had been cut out, and one of her breasts had been severed completely off. The police didn't make any large-scale attempts to catch and identify Andre Chikatilo until the end of 1990. Their plan was to put uniformed officers at large train stations to deter the killer from luring victims there. The police would also have plainclothes officers at smaller train stations so that they could easily spot a man trying to lure women and children away. The deployed officers were told to take down the name and passport number of any older man with a younger woman or child. 
They finally sent the officers out to their stations on October 27, 1990. Three days later, the body of 16-year-old Vadim Gromov was discovered near the Donleskov station. He had been killed on the 17th of October, 10 days before the officers were deployed. Vadim had been stabbed 27 times and strangled to death. The young boy had been castrated and stabbed in the left eye. The tip of his tongue had been severed. On the same day that Vadim's body was found, Andre lured 16-year-old Viktor Teschenko away from a station under surveillance by the police. He stabbed the boy 40 times in a nearby forest, and his body was found a week later. The way in which Andre Chikatilo was finally taken down was from a stroke of luck. Andre was just another name in an index of 20,000 people of possible suspects. He had been mainly excluded from the investigation because of his blood type not matching evidence from prior crime scenes. The leader of the regional crime squad, Fedosov, was passing by a crime scene on his way to a funeral. He made the decision to visit the crime scene instead when he heard it over his radio. Upon arrival, he mentioned Andre Chikatilo. Fedosov had remembered his arrest in 1984 and the unusual contents of his bag, a knife, rope, and Vaseline. That's when authorities finally started closing in on Andre Chikatilo. They had officers staked out at his house, watching him around the clock. They looked into his past. Andre matched the 65-page psychological profile describing the mass murderer. This profile described a man in his late 40s to early 50s of average intelligence who could only achieve sexual arousal through watching his victim suffer. The killer's work required him to travel, and he most likely had a wife and children. At this point, investigators knew Andre was guilty, but they wanted to catch him in the act. On November 20th, 1990, Andre made an attempt to pick up a young boy. Luckily, more people entered the train and Andre gave up and walked away. A police officer immediately questioned the boy on the conversation he had with Andre. The boy said, quote, he offered me some beer and suggested I go with him in his place to watch some videos. Later that morning, authorities decided not to wait any longer. They didn't want to risk another person's life. At this point, they didn't even know how many victims Andre Chikatilo had. At 3.40 p.m. that same day, three officers approached Andre outside a cafe and arrested him. He didn't question why he was being arrested. It made no attempt to resist. He didn't say a single word during the 40-minute drive to the police headquarters. Investigators questioned Andre about his whereabouts on the dates of his victim's deaths. However, they began to worry. They still didn't have any solid evidence against him, and they could only hold Andre for three days without charging. This time, instead of only taking Andre's blood, they took his sperm and hair follicles. His sperm was a match. His blood was type A, but his sperm was AB. That factor was the only reason Andre Chikatilo had been left off before. That factor was the only reason Andre Chikatilo had been let off before. This unusual biological occurrence allowed him to kill dozens more than he should have. The entire case had been centered around the killer having AB blood, like the AB sperm found on the victim's bodies. It wasn't easy for investigators to get a confession out of Andre Chikatilo. He didn't want to talk, and the little he did was of no help to police. A week into questioning on November 22nd, Andre finally started to open up. He said he had a weakness for, quote, perverted sexual displays in films. He also claimed that from his childhood, he was unable to realize himself as a man and a complete human being. The day after, he revealed his mix of attraction and disgust with sex workers, which consisted of 70% of his victims. He said, quote, I often used to spend time at railroad stations and trains, on suburb trains and in buses. There are a lot of different tramps there, both young and old. They ask, demand, and take. These tramps are dragging minors into their activities. The question arose of whether these degenerate elements had the right to exist. It is not difficult to become acquainted with these people. They don't try to hold themselves back. They crawl into your very soul, demanding money, food, vodka, and offering themselves for sex. I used to watch them as they walked away to secluded places. In this statement by Andre, it seems like he was trying to justify the murder and disappearance of sex workers. Andre didn't see them as real human beings. He alluded to the fact that they were easy targets because he could get them to walk off with him to isolated areas, 
In reality, those women were trying to make a living and didn't suspect that an angry, sexually sadistic man would be walking them to their gruesome deaths. Investigators then tried a new tactic to get Andre to confess. Alexander Bukanovsky, a local psychiatrist. Looking back at a serial killer's childhood and youth can sometimes bring forward a particular event that brought forth their attraction to violence and murder. Andre had suffered through war and famine, but that was a collective experience to his whole generation. His relationship with his mother and father was a decent one, and there wasn't any obvious red flags. There was an event, however, that did stick with Andre Chikatilo throughout his entire life. Alexander spoke with Andre about 1934, two years before his birth. Andre's cousin had been kidnapped from his village, and because of the level of famine there at the time, it was assumed that the boy had been eaten. Andre's mother told him that story at the age of five, years later after the event. His mother could have simply told him this horrific story to scare him into staying close to home, or the story could be a terrifying reality in which she actually knew of. Either way, this story left a huge impression on young Andre Chikatilo, and it could have been the spark that started the fire in his obsession with violence, murder, and cannibalism. Alexander believed it was the starting point to his gruesome killing career. He said, quote, when he started telling me about his life, it was already the story of his illness. The two had hit it off. Andre eventually got comfortable enough and confessed to his first murder. The next day, Andre Chikatilo was charged with 36 premeditated murders. He admitted to 34 of them and denied two that occurred in 1986. He confessed to a total of 56 murders and was able to draw sketches of his victims and located bodies that had yet to be discovered by authorities. On these police excursions with Andre, they often brought a dummy with them so he could recreate the last moments of his victims' lives. He used a piece of wood to stab the dummy just like he had stabbed his victims. Andre Chikatilo's wife had no clue that the man she'd been married to for 25 years was a serial killer. What shocked her the most was the fact that he had killed children. She claims that Andre was fond of their own children and grandchildren. The authorities believed her. Andre would never return home after he killed. He would wait days, sometimes a week, so his wife wouldn't be suspicious. When Finya met with her husband one last time, the last thing he said to her was, quote, If only I had followed your advice and got treatment. On April 14, 1992, Andre Chikatilo was charged with 53 murders. In court, he recanted six of those confessed murders. Andre did a lot of disturbing things to prolong his trial, therefore prolonging his life. One specific moment was when he took off all his clothes in court, waved his penis around, and declared, quote, Look at this useless thing. By the end of the trial, psychiatrists found Andre Chikatilo sane. This meant there was no doubt that Andre would have to face the Russian firing squad. On February 14, 1994, Andre Chikatilo was executed by a single gunshot to the head. He's buried in an unmarked grave at the prison cemetery. <laughs>